Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another FS Club webinar. I'm Michael Mainelli, I'm the Executive Chairman as yet. Uh, today, we have uh, two guests here, Ian and Jeremy. I won't read their CVs, uh, the details as ever are on the website uh, so that we can get into things as quickly as possible. Uh, the title today is very much debunking the conventional wisdom in financial markets, AI-powered financial forecasting in action. And we've had a particularly good turnout today, and we'll be looking at sort of the boundary uh, very much between uh, forecasting and prediction. Uh, and Jeremy and Ian will be explaining their real-time observational tool. So I think it should be quite a bit of fun. Uh, just before we get going, uh, a word of thanks to our sponsors. As ever, uh, our sponsors are a very tolerant crowd of people who let us range widely and freely across technology, economics, and finance. And today's presentation and discussion is very much about that boundary between technology and finance. Where, where does this AI-powered financial forecasting have merit? And of course, uh, many of you will know my somewhat caustic views on artificial intelligence. It's really just machine learning. We're using past patterns to predict. But let my prejudices get out of the way and share yours. I would point out to you that the GoTo webinar facility has a really good Q&A uh, function, which will allow me to feed your comments, questions, and thoughts into the discussion later. The agenda, as ever, is my job is to get out of the way and let Ian and Jeremy have, uh, have, have their say. Uh, and then over to you uh, just before half 11, I hope, uh, so that you can have a fairly vibrant discussion going. We do have quite a, people, a few people online today, so please do get your questions and comments in early if you'd like us to feature them. We hope to get as many, through as many as we can. Well, uh, that's me out of the way, uh, and I'm now going to hand over to Jeremy and Ian uh, to chat about how they're debunking conventional wisdom. And I believe Ian is going to speak first. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good morning, for starters. Uh, I joined Algo Dynamics last year to help Jeremy and his team grow what is already a successful company. Uh, my background was in IT for many years, but over the past 25, uh, next slide, please, Michael. Over the next 25, I've managed and built a number of companies which collected market data and stored it in time series or object relational databases for historical analysis. And that, uh, as Jeremy will say in more detail, the future, unfortunately, is not like the past. Many people have got that wrong. And uh, to quote Chris Skinner, another issue about AI is that only Luddites are against it. If you look back many years, people breaking machines that were going to make their lives easier was not terribly clever. So AI will actually help people do their jobs. And in Skinner's uh, most recent blog, he quoted the fact that uh, actually the purpose of software like ours is to enable people, investment managers and portfolio managers to do their job better, but using their own strategy with AI augmenting it. We are not taking their jobs away. That's not what AI should be doing. So that's a very simple beginning. Uh, we now take, next slide, please, Michael. We now take uh, data from exchanges around the world and analyze in real time. And uh, Jeremy will go into a lot more detail about how we do it and the techniques which we use. And the joy of doing that is we use cloud computing too, where we can have variable amounts of IT resource when we need it. And we also don't have to have fights with the IT departments of the organizations to whom we supply it. Uh, so uh, we deliver directly to clients either via email or an API. So again, we don't disrupt anything. And that was a very quick intro because Jeremy has the detail and the facts and what we're doing. Next slide, please, Michael. And over to you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you, thank you, Raj, uh, Michael, and Ian for the uh, introduction. So, um, so absolutely AI based, and we're we're all very much looking forward to the uh, Q and A afterwards. So please do start typing away. Um, this slide um, very contextual because it sort of tells you what we do in a, in a nutshell. So as, as Ian was saying, you know, we have our cloud based computing, we have our notifications, we have our forecasting. This is just one of the examples. Uh, this is looking at um, ETFs, so uh, exchange traded funds in, in the U.S. And we've taken the uh, quality ETF, so this is a ETF which is predominantly, you know, contains companies that have sort of score high on the, the quality factor, and then you've got the momentum and size, but you know, we've just looked at the quality, and you can see on your screen here, so this is just our platform, our analytics in action, you know, produces the up flags, and it produces the end flags, and 
that's sort of the, the typical service we provide uh, to, to most of the uh, portfolio of the traders and the fund managers. So that's an example of that one. So um, if we go to the um, next slide, please, um, Michael. So as, as always with these, uh, with these charts, you know, the, the devil's in the detail. So we just wait for, the, um, for that slide to appear. So the question is, you know, so, so you know, you've got your up flag, you've got your end flag, you know, how good is it? What are the false positives? What are the false negatives? So it's important to sort of understand that. So this is just a slide showing the um, distribution of, of the flag. So you, know, you can see the majority of the flags on the, the one to 2% region. Occasionally there's a flag, which is a, a huge movement there, which is uh, just looking at the screen now. So, you know, above the, the five or 6%. So these are potentially very big moves. And that's essentially all we're doing. And, and this is forecasting in action. And anybody who tries to sort of complicate it and saying, oh my God, you know, that's all thing anyway, but just, you know, keep it simple. We provide directional insights and we do so across most asset classes and financial instruments. Jeremy, so this is one example. Was, yes. For the sake of uh, some, some folks in the audience, I'm not sure they'd be familiar with the way in which traders sometimes use up flags and end flags. You just uh, describe them both in 10 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so very much client specific. So if we take the example of a uh, portfolio manager, uh, they've decided to sort of, you know, allocate accordingly to their own in-house decision making processes. We, as an example, could better time the market entry. So uh, they've already decided to sort of invest in this stock or this portfolio or this, this use case. We can sort of tell them, well, you know, now is probably a very good time or you might want to wait until next week. So that's just on the execution side. Many other use cases, Michael. So there's also the alpha generative side and there's a sort of risk and hedging side. So very much client specific, but the principle is the same. We provide directional forecasting ahead of time and it allows, uh, well, buy side and sell side to make better executions about their organization. So good, good example. So, uh, no, that, that was the next, thank you, Michael, for the next slide. This is just showing you just other examples. This is on uh, gold, um, exactly the same principle. So, you know, you can see the up flags and then the end flags and there's a, a flat period in between and then another up flag and an end flag. Gold's been moving a lot. Uh, it, it's a good example of uh, what we're doing. So this is just one example. If we can go to the um, next slide, please, Michael. You know, same idea. It just shows you the uh, the distribution, so the performance of the uh, historical flags. It will tell you, you know how many flags were good and how many flags were not good. So this is an example of that one. Same principle. Um, just to sort of note and for clarity, and you can probably see on your slide, you know, not every flag will be good, uh, and that's why we sort of put it in context. You know, we we are providing directional insights, we are doing forecasting, but you know, it, it's augmenting your existing strategies and investment processes. So you know, it's part of your portfolio. Your, your tool of portfolio. So just putting this in context and then occasionally you'll get a, a very nice big move as you can see on that one. This is in the uh, six, seven percent. So this is an example of our up flags. And if we go to the um, next slide, please, Michael, this is uh, another example. This time we, we've taken currencies, but you know, exactly the same principle. Uh, and this is directional again, this is more on the, um, the, the downside. So, uh, you know, advanced notification, down flag, end flag, down flag, end flag. So that's what we're doing. So. Um, it looks easy on the chart and we'll delve into the next layer soon about how we actually do it because, you know, the devil's in the detail. And I think Ian alluded to that in the beginning already about this whole AI thing and, and augmenting humans. So if we go to the uh, next slide, please, Michael, this is once again just showing the um, historical distribution of, uh, of the down flags. So it's just showing, you know, how many down flags we've had over the past few years and, and where they are. And there's, there's, some of these down flags are extremely big. You can see that, so, you know, in the sort of minus 5%, these are huge amounts for currencies. If you're trading currencies, if you are in the FX space, you'll probably realize what, what sort of humongous moves we are catching. So this is the bid. And you know, this is the essence of, of, of forecasting and you know, the Jeremy, be just, it alpha capture. Yes, please. Just before we move into yeah. the uh, discussion of how you're doing it, uh, Davy had a question. Are your clients automating execution in line with the flags or just using them to supplement their um, analysis? Really good question. Uh, sure. We have a few of them. Yeah. Ian, please, Prim yeah, you've, you've did well. Yeah. Prim primarily, they, they are definitely not automating it because we are not a regulated entity. We do not give advice. They make their own decisions. We give them the indicators. Um, we tend to be right around 85 to 90 percent historically, but we do not recommend that people automate their trading on the back of our, our indicators. Back yeah, to you, no, thank you, Ian. Put it, putting this in context about sort of, you know, automation on automation. And from, from the previous slides, we're very much a case of augmenting humans. So, so please don't uh, 
we can hopefully have a discussion towards the end. You know, please don't remove that last human element. You know, humans can add a lot of value, especially for the edge cases. Uh, so good, good question on that one. So uh, we go to the next slide. So I guess you know we had a few examples, and now we're just going to get a bit deeper into how it actually works because you know important to understand our clients all want to understand in detail. You know how does it actually work? What's the what's the data behind it? What's the rationale, and what is the logic? So that's on the uh, the next slide. And then yeah, just one more slide. You know that the the first question they usually ask. You know how has it performed historically? So there's the distribution of the flags, um, false positives, false negatives. So these are all quite important in, in data science. So this is some of the opening questions. Then, yeah, as, as per next slide, you know, most asset classes. Um, equity volatility, because of the COVID situation, that, that's been sort of in huge demand, uh, fixed income. Um, FX via, via some of the venues too, actually. So it, it, it's multi-asset class. Um, as long as we get the data from the order books, as long as it's a, a liquid market, a liquid instrument, we, we can provide directional insights. So, uh, so, so that's what we do. And we, Get a bit more deep now to the technology. If we go to the uh, next slide, please, Michael, we get a bit more sort of nitty gritty. Because, you know, this is always a question now. We can show you some nice charts and some nice flags and some nice distribution, just giving you a bit of context. Um, I, I put, I left this slide here just to remind everybody again, and it, 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 it's stating the obvious again, but let's just go through it again. Um, COVID has created very unusual situations. Uh, so, you know, uncorrelated asset classes are becoming correlated. Gold is no longer negative. You know, the, all your assumptions about the past and, and the way that finance works have probably been thrown out and partially as a result of lots of stimulus from the government, partially as a different result. So, you know, whatever assumptions you've made, whatever models you are, whatever factors you're using, it's probably not working very well. And, and I'll openly challenge some of our listeners, I, I know who's on the call today, to, you know, to explain how they're doing. But, you know, th these times are very difficult, very, very difficult. And then, you know, we're, we're probably expecting more and more surprises ahead. So that's why... Once again, to this point about, you know, not using past, not using historical data to try and guess the future because uh, it works until it doesn't work. And, you know, there's something new and unheard of a bit like now. You're going to have a very, very, very tough time. And then just on that one. So good. Now the um, part two, I guess, is, it, yeah. it's the really nitty gritty technical. So we go to the next slide, please, uh, Michael. So, yeah. just, um, just, just before we move yeah. into that, Jeremy, an interesting comment here that Bob McDowell made uh, actually yeah. in advance of showing this slide. Believe it or not, so he said, fear and really realization of mortality are great catalysts for behavior change. <laughs> so yeah. does AI reflect these human emotions? And I, I think it's a really good point, Bob. So anyway, uh, over to you, Jeremy. Back into the, the let's so, let's maybe cover that one because you know it's the emotions, absolutely. So we'll come on to that. So um, slight introduction to machine learning, and and we'll delve more. I, I, I know Michael has a strong opinion about it, but you know we've. Put everything together and and you know there are subtleties between the machine learnings and the ais but let's just have a, a splash screen of, of some of the terminology the technology shown here by the way uh, they've been around a long time um bayesian for instance you know the, in fact, that, that sort of goes back a few centuries and, and and same for the other ones too by the way so these technologies are not new so just keep that in mind i think the novelty now and going back to the you know the ai winters the big difference now is arguably there's more data. I'm not saying that's better, but you know, there is more digitization. The second catalyst by far, it's the computing power. It, it's the fact that, you know, us as, as a growing company now, you know, we can have pretty much, dare I say, near infinite computing power. And, and I think that that's changed the landscape. So, you know, are we heading for another AI winter? I don't think so, especially because of the computing power. And, and Ian has seen a few cycles of, so, you know, AI cycles are not basically, but I think we're there definitely. So very briefly, um, just a few words on some of these technologies. I'm not going to cover them all. Um, neural networks, it, it's just a bunch of matrices trying to sort of emulate what the human brain is doing. So, you know, if you see a cat numerous times at some point, your, your neurons are going to sort of clock onto the fact this is a cat so you can have different weighting. So, you know, just weighting the matrices. Uh, genetic algorithms comes a bit more from biology where you just start randomly and you let the algorithms just develop. In, in, in different different scenarios, and you know, you, you keep cutting them off. Um, hidden Markov is more of a speech processing thing, uh, and decision trees is one of my favourite ones. And I, I I was hoping it would be sunny today, but it's a bit rainy. So you know, assuming based on historical data that it's a sunny day and it's two p.m. and you hear an ice cream van, it's probably an ice cream van, uh, and that's just a purely decision tree. So there's nothing magic about these these machine learning algorithms. It's it's just you know a way of dealing with the data, and if we can. Go to the next slide, please. Um, the common elements with all these machine learning algorithms and, and 
most other ones, by the way. It's um, it's that they are, you know, they need to be trained. So there, there is a, a supervising element. So, you know, you take your historical data and you start labeling it and you start building your predictive models. This works okay as, as long as the future looks like the past. And, and I think we had a comment just before Michael brought it up, you know, especially in financial markets, you know, you are going to have huge, huge, huge behavioral changes. So, you know, your, your model will work up to a certain point and then it just stops working. And the fancy technical term for this, by the way, is, is regime switching. So these financial time series are, are very, very prone to re regime switching and that makes it incredibly difficult. And that's why we are doing what we're doing. We are not model-based. Uh, we are not historical data. There is no training in what we do. So, so that's the difference. So we can go to the, the next bit, which is describing what we're doing, which is the um, unsupervised. We go to the uh, next slide, please, Michael. So that, that's what we're doing, so unsupervised. So we've made no assumptions uh, about the data. There's no labeling. We're just breaking down the order flows. We're just descriptively you know, categorizing what's going on in real time. And even if we've never seen it before, even if it's some new event, you know, I say COVID, you know, we'll be able to break it down to the structure. So we're adding structure to, to, to random data because, you know, financial data for all intents and purposes, it is random, brownie most of the time. So that's what we're doing. We are structuring, we are clustering the, uh, the data we're seeing. So if we can go to the um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the, the next layer. We're, we're peeling down. We're sort of giving you more and more tech about uh, what we're doing and um so this, this is just the, the breakdown so um the methodology we're using is uh, unsupervised so we go to the uh, next slide please michael the uh, graphical slide so um the methodology we're using is unsupervised uh, machine learning and the detail is we're getting the data from the limit order books so every single exchange uh, derivatives futures equities there will be a, a, a exchange order book there'll be buyers and sellers on either side. So we are data mining, we are clustering the entire order book. And the only question we try to answer is who is doing what? So uh, very much behavioral based, very much real time data order flow based. That's our only question and that's the only answer we are providing, who is doing what at the exchange level? So that, that's our clever technology. And then yes, Richard did get a Nobel Prize for this at the time. Um, not, not a Cambridge person, by the way, um, Chicago. So thank you, Richard, for providing some of the uh, intellectual work that we've done. So that's on that one. And the next slide is a bit more graphical. This is just showing in finer detail what we're doing with, with the order books. As I said, you know, it's unsupervised uh, and it is, it is machine learning and it is clustering. So you can see from your diagram there, there this, you know, it's a normal day in the market, you know, buys and sellers across the order book, nothing, nothing special that with our unsupervised um, algorithms, we are clustering the behavior. And uh, there's some nice papers out there. It's, a, it's information rate clustering. So we are clustering on the uh, entropy information rate. So we're day in, day out, we are producing these clusters of, of market at market participants um, behaving in the same way. So that's what we're doing. We go to the next slide. This is a, this is a normal day in the market, by the way. The um, next slide is, is one of our flag events. It's one of our anomaly events. Um, you know, most of the time, the markets are somewhat random, Brownian motion type thing. And then the next slide, uh, this is one of our flags. At this point in time, um, something's not right. Uh, essentially, everybody's behaving the same way. Everybody's doing the same thing. It is showing up in the order book. So uh, this is what generates the flags. And you've seen it from the previous slides. You know, how do we get one of these up flags or these down flags of that one? And then, you know, that's the the whole movement, but you know, this does occur quite frequently. So the moment the markets are in a, a non-random state, we flag it up and then same thing on the end. We produce our end flag to say, okay, the, the anomaly is over, you know, we're, we're back to random, we're back to Brownian motion again in, in the limit order book. So that's in a nutshell. There's much more, there's much more behind it. There's some lovely books out there. There's the, uh, the Wiley FinTech, there's a chapter on that one and we do also run regular webinars um, across the board just to sort of delve a bit more to this. And, you know, obviously our clients do want to understand how it works, but, you know, the basic principle is, you know, we're clustering all the activity in the limit order books and we're producing directional insights based on what we are seeing in the, in the order flow. So good. Um, that's all that one. If we can go to the, the next slide, it's just a, a sneak preview about what's going on. We've been growing enormously, especially with the um, COVID situation, dare I say, it's been sort of, you know, we've been very helpful for our clients. This is just one of our New York hedge fund clients. They're one of the few clients who are actually happy to go on the record. This is the um, the press release we had um, a few months ago. So, um, so S&P has been sort of trading enormously. Uh, you know, with our 
directional insights. They've produced um, double digit returns. This is not basis points. We're talking, you know, tens and tens of percentage points outperformance. So this is huge outperformance uh, just based on our analytics. So this is just one example of what we're doing. And there's many other examples. As I said, we can't always talk about our institutional clients that are a bit protective somehow. And, but uh, that's just one example of that's on that one. How we sort of adding tremendous value to our, our clients across the board. So this is on that one. So, uh, and then if we go to the um, next slide, please, this is a bit more sort of context, just a, a sneak preview that we're always innovating. We are listening to clients um, across the board about what they want. Um, what's been ex particularly relevant, especially for the, uh, the large buy side funds is, you know, it, it's the factor models. So if you're familiar with the uh, portfolio construction, you know, the, you might be biased towards, you know, value, style and momentum. So we've created some new analytics specifically for our factor allocation clients. So they're just going to be able to know when to tilt the portfolio. And then once again, yeah, this is very much a alpha generative outperformance. And just to reiterate the point Ian made already, you know, we're not changing their investment strategy. Uh, we're just augmenting their decision-making process. We're helping them a bit better on the timing side uh, and just giving this additional dimension, this additional value add about, you know, what are we seeing? What are people actually doing? What's actually happening in the market? And this gives them a, additional oversight, additional overlays for their portfolio. Okay, now that's me for now. Um, I think there's been quite a few questions. Uh, it's probably a good time to stop now. So we can go to it the next indeed. slide. And it's, it's, uh, it is, okay, I'm, I'm gonna hand, hand it back to Michael then. So but thank you, right. thank you, Michael. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've got quite a few questions here. So uh, might just be a bit snappy on some of the early ones. Um, uh, because of the audience and the spanning of quite a variety of sectors, John Falk asks, uh, makes an interesting point. Uh, he says, uh, as a comment, it seems like the old Z score algorithm, though based on different information. Um, interesting. I don't think Z would be looking at the order book flow. I'm, I'm, I might be wrong on that yeah. one. So yeah, I it's think it's a bit more information historical. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Good, good point. Actually, that one. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, Malika Polrich would like to know what time frame do you, uh, do your clients trade on your data? Um, it's definitely not intraday. So they'll get the flag, so end of day, sometimes even end of week uh, for our Magnum products. You know, it, it tends to be the bigger movement. It is definitely not a high frequency play. So just be on we that one. We're talking daily. Products. We have two different products for the larger institutions trading very large volumes and holding large holdings. Yeah. We have a Magnum product that goes out up to a month. And the regular product is end of day, and they'll trade within a couple or three days. Uh, Bob McNaught would like to understand a little bit better. What's your pricing model? Do you include a success fee component? Uh, we don't include a success fee, but we do vary the pricing depending on the benefits of the clients, the number of instruments they're using, the more importantly, the assets under management. If you make a few basis points on a trillion, you've saved an awful lot of money. If you make a few basis points on a million, you haven't saved as much. So we try to balance the pricing to suit that. Uh, Henry Winnon uh, says, one assumes this only works for deep and liquid markets with lots of flows off which you can pick up signals. What of other markets which are equally large, mm. but more over the counter OTC like, for example, reinsurance or insurance? Um, good one. We've done quite a few projects. Unfortunately, I can't talk about it. Um, if it's OTC, there's usually some proxy somewhere. It, it might be a credit default swap or it might be an ETF. So there's usually some ways of doing it. And it's probably, it won't be on the actual underlying. It will be on one of the proxies or derivatives. So um, as long as there's something out there which is liquid and which tracks what they want to monitor, Michael, it, it, it's usually doable in some, in some shape or form. Okay. John Spensley is curious if you cover sentiment analysis or have any thoughts on that? Um, I do. Um, mixed views. Um, very mixed views. Uh, you know, what, what the news is, is describing, what people say they're doing, what actually happens is, is not always the same. So I, I know there's a lot of sentiment products out there. Um, as I said, mixed views. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to stop there. Ian, any opinion before I sort of say anything that one I might regret? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we tend to avoid, the only sentiment we look at is the sentiment of the behavior of the people trading. Yeah. That's what we do. We, we look at the behavior actually in the market. We don't look at news or any other non-trading information, put it that way. Okay. 
Well, uh, John Spensley uh, picks up on that point exactly. He's sort of curious, could you describe some of the standard trading behaviors which are used by market actors and how the system detects them and what it says about them? Oh, nice one, nice one. So we've got some lovely cases at the, uh, in, in Japan, the uh, Japanese housewives are the second largest asset class. That are. So usually in, in the liquid market, you can break it down to, so, you know, market making, intraday, execution algorithms, large blocks. So, you know, it, it's a combination of, of different market participants. It, it doesn't matter which, which participants, as, as long as there's some discernible characteristics from these participants, we'll, we'll pick it up. And, you know, e even if at some point there's going to be a, a new type of participant, you know, that's fine, we'll, we'll pick it up. So it's market specific and we're very agnostic to what's happening, as long as it's not completely random, which quite frankly doesn't actually happen that often when, when you think about it. So. Uh, Liz Thrussell um, is asking, do you have flags on equities? And if so, do you look at fundamentals? And perhaps maybe just a little bit more explanation about the slide you had very early on about your equity flags. Yeah, um, we do cover single stocks. That's fine. Um, what we've seen with single stocks is they're um, more exposed to, uh, I think they call it esoteric risk. So, you know, company earnings, accounting issues. So so that's on that one. So, yeah, um, it's okay on single stocks, but there's some lovely research out there I need to remind myself what the paper is you know if you look at single stock movements uh, a lot of the movement comes from the sector or the economy or from the macro drivers whereas there's only a, a small proportion of that movement which is stock specific so that's why we we'd rather operate at the macro level but yeah we, we can do both depending on, on client requirements it's a lot of customization usually we didn't want to turn this in the sales pitch but we usually do spend a lot of time with our clients to understand what they really want to be doing because you know we have generic flags but then there's client use cases which we can only talk about so much unfortunately so yeah unfortunately well, well, most of our clients see us as being a competitive advantage so they won't let us talk about what they're doing which is very annoying if you're no, attempting yeah. to sell the product <laughs> well uh, let's stick to single stock for another point uh, jeremy light points out that tesla's had some fairly extreme price action recently uh, how's your algorithm yeah, yeah. work for tesla uh we did uh we got some tesla flags um, I'll, be, I'll get straight to the point. Um, for Tesla, you would have been better buy and hold. Uh, so I'll come straight to that one. So, if, if, you know, if you were executing in and out of Tesla as part of a portfolio, absolutely. If, if you benchmarked our flags against Tesla buy and hold, you would have been better just buying and holding. But it has been very volatile. So, you know, depending on your risk appetite or, or you sort of dip in, dip out and you hedge carefully or you just do a buy only long. So use case again, uh, Michael, about what's what the client wants to achieve in terms of returns and risk and exposure. So. Mm. I mean, you can't do everything and be everywhere. So you can share it as, I'm mean, curious, what stock exchanges are covered and what are sort of any immediate plans to cover something else? Uh, we've got most of them, the, um, you know, it's in the actually, Ian, you can probably t tell about the North American one, which we don't have, actually. That's the only one yeah, we don't quite... have, is it, sir? <laughs> The only one we haven't implemented yet is because no one's asked for it, but I got shouted at by a friend of mine who works for the Toronto Exchange. We don't cover that because we haven't had a single client ask for it yet, but we cover most of the rest of the world's exchanges. And we also are able to derive instruments from, as Jeremy was saying earlier, if you're looking at something that's traded OTC, we can usually derive it by reverse engineering a derivative. So we, we can get most instruments. We cover a very broad range, and we've done some obscure client-specific work on derivatives for a client in Hong Kong, who, again, won't let us talk about their name. Uh, Ian continues. He's asking, is the software and its messaging available in, for example, Chinese, German, Korean, or Russian? Uh, let's go on that one. So, um, yes to the most of the above. We might do it via MSCI benchmarks. Uh, mainland China A share, so pretty much. Uh, I think the only bit, so other than, you know, Canadian Toronto Exchange, we don't cover, uh, we're a bit low on Latin America too, just because nobody's asked us again. Uh, we've done South, South Africa, so I think pretty much yes to, to most of the above, Michael, in terms of coverage and... Uh, You're talking What's about markets. Question? I think uh, Ian's actually after the languages, if you, if you yeah, do different yeah. languages as well. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, I have to, unfortunately, say we have the... Uh, uh, Chinese simplified. Uh, we've got the Taiwan version. We, we don't have the uh, Russian script. Is, is that the question, Michael? Sorry, I, I didn't fully understand yeah. the question about that. Uh, right. uh, no, we don't. It, it, it's, dare I say, predominantly English, which is a bit short sighted. Well, that's good feedback, by the way. Thank you from the uh, caller. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should expand our linguistic skills a bit. Yes, thank you. 
And Bob McDowell is kind of interested, you know, ESG, environmental social governance, is a growing trend, or some would say it's fashionable. Um, how do your notions, uh, oh, sorry, how do these notions of ESG feed into your proposition? We've got ESG coverage, um, ESG funds. The observation we've seen, and you know, we've, we've been at it for a long time, the lack of strict definition makes it quite difficult. So, you know, if the client thinks they have an ESG fund, we will happily provide insights, directional forecasting on that. It, it's just, you know, the client needs to tell us what they think is their flavor of ESG. I think that's where we get caught out. And I think it's a industry-wide problem, by the way. There's a lack of firm definition, so we can implement what's, what's required in terms of, you know, setting our own ESG standards. It's probably not quite our cup of tea, but yes, good, good point. Uh, Lloyd Greensight uh, sent through a couple comments. I'm, I'm going to read them together because I think it's probably best taken as a whole. Um, as you're catching signals that indicate a move from randomness, browning in motion, to clusters, are there any alternative data sources you use that help provide that early indication? Uh, he also okay. goes on to say, mm -hmm. do you also consider the bid offer spread, particularly as these have widened in general? Yeah, okay. Uh, good questions. Um, in terms of alternative data sets, no. Um, it's probably worth having a separate talk just on that one, actually. Um, but ask spread, yeah, we could look at it. Uh, we don't, because, you know, if it widens, you start getting a bit suspicious, especially if it's e-liquid market. So I, I guess two, two short answers is, is two no's. We, we don't look at alternative data, and we, we don't look at the spread just because we're getting different information from the order book, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Malika Polraj is curious, what does your data say about recent movements in gold? Uh, up flags again, I should have shown actually, it's, it's gone wild again. And then here's the difficult bit actually, the case study in itself, you know, usually gold is negatively correlated with equities, it's not the case now. So, you know, yet again, one of the previous assumptions has just gone down the window again. Uh, we still have up flags on gold, so I think we're, sorry, I don't want to be sounding as investment advice, but you know, we have open up flags on gold, gold miners, uh, gold futures, so we're, that's what we're seeing as of as of this morning on the platform. So, uh, Matthew Leach uh, summarizes. We've got a couple of comments. I'm going to come to in a second, which are wonderfully, uh, delightfully um, circular and recursive. Uh, I'll start with Matthews. The algorithm tells a trader what other traders are currently trying to do, according to the order book. It looks for right. moments. Many traders are trying to do the same thing, but do traders ever think that the majority of traders are wrong? just a herd of people who have misunderstood something important and are now trying to do the wrong thing. Yeah, interesting. It is circular. It's partly philosophical. I don't know. Ian, do you want to, do you want to venture on that one? Well, they, <laughs> even if they are doing the wrong thing, they are influencing the market and it is moving and we spot the movement. Well, That's what we do. It, whether they're doing the wrong thing or the right thing, we spot the movement. Hmm. Well, here's another one of the same vein. Um, Ian Hart, uh, my hat's off to you on this one. I'll read this very <laughs> slowly. It's very short, though. What is your view on momentum as a factor, as it seems to have persistence? Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and that's why our new product range is a, a directional insight for momentum, actually. Yeah, it does. And, and, and I think the point is about, you know, some of our, uh, some of the larger funds, they operate on different timescales. So it's not like people can move in and out instantaneously. So yeah, absolutely, momentum's there, and I think it's been proven over the years. It may or may not have been, I think recently it's been very good anyway. So yeah, absolutely, um, it's there. We can do an even better job. I, I don't think it will go away anytime soon, actually, just because, you know, different type of market participants, different, different mandates, and that's, that's, that's the reason, yeah, absolutely. When we launch um, the new product, we should perhaps have a conversation with Ian offline. <laughs> yeah, about momentum and momentum, actually, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, in your opening, you, you remarked on uh, regime change uh, as being you know, one of the big issues. Um, did, and Henry Winon would like to know, do you work to discover regime changes? And how are, accurate are you across different asset classes? Um, oh gosh, the, the easiest one is, is just looking at equity volatilities. And we've got one of the um, UX products on equity volatility. That's probably our, our single easiest way of just spotting regime switches. You know, when, when the VIX starts spiking up and we flagged it a few days before, that's our best regime indicator by far. So, uh, and then it usually drills down into other asset classes. But yeah, so, but you know, once again, it is purely observational. We, we're having you no know, opinion or, or, or model or pre-assumption about, you know, what a regime is or when, it's, when it switches or when it changes. It's just, you know, we're observing big 
up flags on, on the VIX. And, and that's what we're doing. That's what we're observing. That's what we're reporting. So, and then, you know, as I said, regime switches happen enormously, happen all the time. They happen on different time scales. It, it is a very tough market. So other than humbly suggesting doing what we're doing, which is observing what's happening in real time, I sort of think that any attempt at modeling and, and AI and machine learning is possibly not the right approach, Michael. Sorry, I don't want to pour petrol on the fire here, but I, I don't think it's the right tool set for these financial. I don't know. I'll, maybe I'll leave that in for another day or a beer discussion about you know how to not use models for financial financial markets. So. Uh, well, we've got a few more points on that in a moment. But yeah. let, me, let me start here. Uh, John Spensley is curious. Stocks yeah. can have similar charts in particular sectors. Can you detect these similarities or dissimilarities? Yeah, so um, across different sectors, and this is one of our new product launches, which once again, I, I didn't want to put everything in there. Um, across sectors, it becomes very interesting. So when you get the same confirmation, the same directional flags across, I don't know, consumers, industrials, whatever, basically, potentially suggests that, you know, we're looking at even bigger moves. So yeah, absolutely, uh, cross sector thing. And it's one of our, our new features we're launching to actually. So now one up flag on one instrument's great. When you get numerous up flags across different instruments, different sectors, that's probably a very, very, very strong indicator about what to expect. Usually, I'm saying not always, but it sort of suggests that there might be some I don't know, massive government stimulus or some quite big macro fundamental changes globally. You know, it's the money from one sector, be it fixed incomes, going to it, whatever. There's some big rotational money going on, and we sort of happily pick up on that. That's, that's an easy one, so to speak, yes. Yeah. Well, that leads uh, Bob McDowell to question uh, political sanctions and other data, uh, sorry, uh, other situations uh, can give uh, difficulties accessing data. You know, is this a problem to the scope of your proposition? Um, mainland China data hasn't always been easy on that one. Um, mixed views. As I said, there's usually a proxy somewhere, and, and this goes back a few years. There was a good case study about, uh, well, there was one about the um, Swiss National Bank depegging their currency, mm -hmm. and there was another one about uh, China. So it, it will usually show up somewhere, not always in the obvious places, but, you know, there's usually something somewhere. Unless it's a complete earthquake. When I mean earthquake, it's not a physical earthquake, but you know the impact of a meteorite out of the blue dropping. So you know, d depending case by case. But as I said, you know, these are very efficient markets. You know, Michael, there's usually something somewhere smoking. There's something going on there, and we sort of, you know, that's what we do. We we pick it up. We we report it. We flag it. Say, so, you know, something's something's moving there. So okay. Well, uh, this is a one which uh, I find a little bit difficult to ask in a way, because you've got your sales and marketing director with you, Ian. <laughs> uh, but Matthew Leach is curious, if everyone did this, how would markets behave? Uh, we'd probably retire with a big bag of money, and then it wouldn't matter. Yes. <laughs> it's an interesting one. Yes. Uh, when we sell to everyone, we'll be very old and very tired, I would imagine. So uh, for the moment, yeah. we're not particularly concerned. Good point. Actually, on, on that one too, actually, and then, uh, you know, we have use cases across the board. So it's not like everybody's doing exactly the same thing at exactly the right the same time using our exactly the same insights. So it, 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 you know, it's pretty diversified in that sense. But good questions about, you know, are we going to be you mentioned the classes, that, yes. This is from Gerd van der Elst. Uh, you mentioned your systems observe and analyze behavior. Are there any earlier indicators that you look at that drive behavior? You mentioned news as not being one, but are there any other ones? Um, I'm trying to think, actually, I mean, not from our side, we, we don't do it, but um, let me just keep it short and sweet, Michael. Um, no, uh, we, you know, we, we are on the behavioral side. We are looking at what's happening, what other people are doing. That's what we're good at. And, and if there's the other sources. Basis, then, yeah, 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 absolutely. We monitor behavior in the markets and we do have clients who also look at sentiment, but they look at it somewhere yeah. else, not from us. That's basically it. We monitor yeah, the behavior yeah. in the market. And Jeremy Light is kicking in. Uh, I find this interesting, actually, as I was uh, dealing with someone this morning about uh, behaviors for risk management in markets. Can the algorithm identify manipulated markets where order books may look unusual uh, for Jeremy? Um, I wish I could say more, actually. We, we, we have dealt with uh, large government organizations on the regulatory side. Uh, there are use cases. It, it's just commercially, it, it's not the way we've gone. But yeah, absolutely. There are use cases of, uh, I don't even want to say the words, Michael, but yeah, when, when it appears that there's a, a group of people seem to have a bit more advanced information, absolutely. We have, we have use cases on that one, though, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, Donald McCray to you, Jeremy. Uh, do you consider you add any value to the real economy? Uh, yes, big time. Um, um, think about people's pensions. Um, I, I think most of us, you know, if we're following our various government schemes, our own portfolios, um, it's a tough one out there. So yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not, not going to delve much more to that one. So yes. Yeah, and Gertz, come back. Are you also looking at crypto? Um, this is this is having Ian on the call. Uh, we uh, the, the CME Group, uh, Chicago Group. They have two listed uh, crypto derivatives. We cover them. So you know, we, we cover the the old school listed cryptos, not not the newer ones. But yeah, we do cover a tiny bit of crypto. Yes. Okay. That's, it, it, it's not Ian's thing. It's a fan base. We cover the fact that other people are daft enough to trade them. Put it that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we monitor it. We look at this. We look at it. So. Yeah. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, well, look, uh, I'm already getting some uh, some thanks here uh, and some appreciation, which is always a sign we're drawing to the end of our time. Uh, just back to both of you. Um, is there any? Well, actually, we just got one. I'll squeeze one last one in from Liz Thrussell. Uh, does the customer provide the list of funds and currencies before they get the flags, or are you suggesting sets of flags to them? We tend to meet every client before we start. We sit down with the client and define what their interest is. We don't try and tell them which instruments to look at. We we define their interest and then we feed them the information for those in, instruments. Okay. Um, so a, a, any last comments? Uh, I'll, I'll turn to Ian first and then to Jeremy. Ian? Uh, the most important comment is it's been extremely interesting and the questions are actually worthwhile and interesting and a little bit challenging, which is what one would like on, a, on an event like this. No, I think it's, uh, from our viewpoint, gone pretty well. I hope mm -hmm. the audience thinks so, too. <laughs> and Jeremy? Likewise, likewise. Very, very, I think the Q&A is always a more interesting bit, especially this time, actually. So thank you. Thank you for all those questions. Much, much appreciated, sir. Well, I'm certainly going to take some stuff away. I, I liked Matthew's comment about our <laughs> what if everybody does this. and. Uh, and I am particularly uh, thrilled uh, with the idea that momentum has a persistence all of its own, which is, <laughs> reminds me of an old quote about uh, from uh, Douglas Heard about Jeffrey Howe, something to the effect that uh, uh, I think it was, yes, inertia has momentum all of its own in politics. <laughs> <laughs> I shall, I shall nice leave that for those of us of a nice physics one. or engineering bent to ponder. Anyway, uh, I'm afraid at the time available, I'm just going to have to turn quickly to some thanks so that we close on time. Um, my first round of thanks is very much to our sponsors. Um, as ever, uh, you're extremely kind and generous, uh, allowing us uh, to range widely and freely. And I think today was a particularly good example of that interesting boundary between technology and finance for us. Um, many uh, of the people who sponsor us do provide either services in finance or technology services, including uh, AI monitoring and compliance. So um, over to you to, uh, to to chat and get in touch with uh, Jeremy and Ian if you'd like. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience. Wow, today was a delight. Uh, very easy for me. No need to fake questions. Uh, the, the <laughs> no man on the clap omnibus. Uh, so thanks for all your excellent comments uh, and questions. We uh, do have some webinars coming up this week. Uh, it's a busy day today. We have a fascinating webinar at uh, 3.30 today. Uh, Madeline Moon, uh, who uh, used to handle NATO, and Francis Tusa, a great security guy, looking really at this whole idea of global Britain. What's the substance to it? Uh, so a very intense political discussion ahead this afternoon. Uh, we have tomorrow uh, David Pitt Watson talking about unfit for purpose, but in a positive way, uh, what we can do to fix the pension system. Uh, we also have on Wednesday over from Amsterdam Climate Kick and Kirsten Dumlop, who is one of the brightest people I've ever met. And she's going to be talking about the EU's approach to innovation as if it mattered and how to use green investment to stimulate the economy post COVID. Uh, a really uh, deep influencer over in Europe and one I think well worth watching if you have any interest in finance, ESG. Uh, green, what have you. And then finally, uh, on Thursday, Julian Enoizzi, who heads up Pool Re, the, uh, probably one of the leading public-private reinsurers in the world, is going to be speaking at 11 about things that he's been working on for many years. Uh, I'll give him credit for sure. 
uh, and looking towards a resilience re how can we use public-private reinsurance to handle big future actions, not just pandemics, but uh, other, other things as well, such as mass coronal objections and uh, widespread cyber disaster catastrophe, uh, which we've been working with them for a while on. So quite a bit coming up. But finally, of course, gentlemen, I, I need to thank you. Uh, without you, we wouldn't have today. And it's been really good, uh, very interesting. And thanks for your thoughts. I'm afraid in this day of COVID-19, I'm unable to open up and let the audience show their applause, but I will uh, get out my karmic clapper here. And I will uh, thank you on behalf of the audience, and I'll now bring things to a close. Uh, so goodbye, one and all. Uh, goodbye, Jeremy. Goodbye, you. Thank you. Thank you. you.